In 2019, the finals of the World Chase Tag saw one of its most incredible performances as Carl Cord Moller evaded chaser Seth Wang for a full 20 seconds, a near impossible feat, winning Carl's team the much coveted championship. The amount of coordination required for both the chaser and the evader is phenomenal, but the two honestly make it look so easy. But chasing aside, even simple walking is extraordinarily complex, as animators will tell you. Today we're going to look at how the brain coordinates coordinates movement, both voluntary and involuntary. In the previous lesson, we saw that motor control primarily happens up here in the motor cortex, but there are two other areas of the brain that also play important parts, the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. Broadly speaking, this is what these parts do. The cerebellum remembers and coordinates smooth, well-sequenced movements. The basal ganglia, located between the two halves of the brain, channels information from all sorts of regions to the motor cortex. And then finally, the primary motor cortex itself is mostly responsible for movement of voluntary skeletal muscles. Straightforward enough, right? But one funny quirk of our brain is this complicated term called hemispheric lateralization, which simply means that it was discovered that the right half of our brain controls the left half of our body. It's also why a stroke in the right half of the brain can cause facial features to droop on the left side of a person's face. The other funny quirk is that amazingly in the motor cortex, there's literally a physical correspondence from top to bottom between the brain and the body. So up at the very top of the brain or this part of the cortex over here, we've got control of our feet and our legs and then our torso going up to the arms, parts of the hand, and parts of the face. So it physically maps out, but from the top to bottom. And notice how much space is assigned to the hands and the face. It's very disproportionate to our actual bodies. In fact, if our bodies actually represented the proportions of the motor cortex that was allocated to its control, we will look something like this. Yep, best not to think about it for too long. So if you need to move your right arm, then in the left part of your brain up here in the motor cortex, something will activate, causing the signal to get sent down the spinal cord into this region of muscles over here to raise your right arm. But sometimes it literally takes too long for a signal to have to go through the brain and back again for processing. True, you may only save fractions of a second, but sometimes that's all you need to get out of danger. And so our bodies were designed with shortcuts, AKA spinal reflexes. These automatic responses ensure that there's no time delay by having to relay the message to and from the brain. Input from the sensory neuron does a quick UE here in the spinal cord and straight out again to the motor neuron without having to bypass the brain. Another famous example of this is the knee jerk reflex, when some pressure is quickly applied just under your kneecap, causing your lower leg to suddenly kick upwards. And it's not just for fun. When the doctor does this, they're actually checking that the connections in your lower spine are healthy. This is also known as the patella reflex. So once again, sensory input going through this neuron circles immediately out back again through the motor neuron for the effect to take place, completely bypassing the brain. Now, there's one difference between these two spinal reflexes. Can you see what it is? It is the presence of this little guy right here, the interneuron. You see the patella reflex is an example of a monosynaptic arc because it only has one synapse or one junction between the two neurons. On the right is a polysynaptic reflex arc because there's more than one junction. In this case, there's one here and one over here. One's not necessarily better than the other, although monosynaptic arcs are simpler. And if you're wondering, why do we even need the patella reflex? Like how often do I get hit in the knee and need my leg to kick upwards without me thinking about it? Well, it's because whenever that ligament gets stretched, our quads automatically tense up. And this is really important in maintaining posture and balance while standing still or even running or doing whatever amazing things these guys are doing. There are so many incredible ways our body maintains control, both consciously and unconsciously, and hopefully we now appreciate it a little bit more.